Hello and welcome to Pedestrian Coach. My name is Andrew McMillan. I am a freelance journalist based in Brisbane, Australia. And the session that I am going to be talking to you about today is on feature journalism and interviewing. I am a freelance journalist based in Brisbane, Australia. I'm coming to you live from my home office here. And uh, what you'll be le learning from me today is a bit about my career as a freelance feature journalist and also how I approach the task of interviewing, which is a difficult and tricky beast at the best of times. So to begin, for any high school students or university students listening to this session, I want to point out that uh, please understand that a career in professional writing means having homework assignments due for the rest of your life. This is not something to go into lightly if you're uh, currently studying and not really enjoying the, the constant deadlines and assignments being set by uh, those above you. So the only difference between school and uni and working in journalism is that if you're lucky, the assignments will be on topics you're actually interested in rather than work set by some faceless bureaucrat or stuffy lecturer. So this presentation will just contain me kind of giving you some advice, perhaps, or some thoughts, some food for thought on your potential career in journalism. What I've done is taken some notes, and I've got a pen, and these are the essential tools of journalism, as well as a voice recorder. I tend to record everything that I do professionally in case I ever want to go back and reflect on something that my sources said during an interview or something that I came up with myself. Uh, I think it's good practice to document my own professional successes and uh, failures and just keep everything handy on record. Uh, it's al also good practice to do so if you come to the point where you're being interviewed by other people and you can check whether you're being potentially misquoted. So. What I wanted to do here was uh, talk about the best case scenario, which uh, I find myself in now as a, f a freelance journalist of about five years standing and having just published my first book, which is called Talking Smack, Honest Conversations About Drugs, which I'll come to soon. Um, the best case scenario is that you'll get to the space where you will be writing, you'll be paid to write about shit that interests you when you're starting out though, you're likely to have to do some writing for little or zero dollars. And it won't always be about shit that interests you, unfortunately. So I'll give you a bit of my background on where I come from as a professional journalist. But keep in mind that I started about seven years ago. And the environment and the markets, as it were, for uh, freelance writing has changed a bit since then. So my first professional published work was uh, for a Brisbane street press called Rave Magazine, which no longer exists, unfortunately. And for them, I wrote live music reviews for around two years as a hobby. So my background is in music journalism. And I, like I said, two years, it was purely a way to uh, get free tickets to shows that I would otherwise have to pay for. And also, it gave me the chance to write about something which interested me, which has long interested me, which is music. So I would... Uh, th th this idea of writing for a local street press, and at the same time, a website called fasterlouder.com.au, which still exists today and is flourishing. Um, I ca I, these came about because I contacted the editors of both sites, um, with a submission of my work, just as a sample of something that I had written based on a show that I saw here in Brisbane um, in 2007 as a 19-year-old. And uh, I suppose based on the strength of or the quality of what I submitted to them, both of those editors decided to give me some more work. They started to give me some assignments or they put me on their lists of contributors. So... Uh, I started in music journalism, as I said, but my path was quite slow and steady for the first two years. It was a hobby. I didn't have lofty goals or ambitions. I just reviewed live music for little or no money because I loved it for Faster Louder and for Rave Magazine. 
and I found that these were ideal incubators for practicing writing because I had assignments, deadlines, and an audience. Three very important ingredients for any form of writing, uh, other than your own diary or journal, I suppose. So, as you, many of you are music fans, I'm sure, you won't be surprised when I say that uh, music brings out passion and emotion in people. and when it comes to writing about music, especially live music, which is such a subjective experience for so many people, if you do a good job as a, a music critic, you may get the occasional kudos from a kind internet commenter. They do exist, I promise you. They are quite rare, but uh, some people out there decide to take the time to write something positive. But it's more likely that you'll be abused if you get something wrong or if you don't qualify your opinion. So... This goes uh, for many types of writing, but I found particularly with music criticism, uh, you're going to get people who just disagree with what you say, and that's kind of par for the course. It's not something that really can be controlled or accounted for, and uh, also you shouldn't be cowed or uh, you shouldn't feel that you have to pander or lower your your own writing standards in order to um, try and please an audience because ultimately writing shouldn't be about pleasing an audience it should be about pleasing yourself you should be interested in and proud of your own work so on that topic of uh, internet commenters some of the early stuff that I wrote for Rave Magazine and Faster Louder was okay and it got some um, praise from random internet commenters and forum members and whereas other reviews were less so, uh, you know, people take umbrage to th certain things that you write. Uh, even members of local bands in Brisbane, I'm sure, um, weren't too happy with some of the reviews that I gave their bands. But that's kind of the nature of media. If you're out there as a performer, uh, a band up on stage and people come to see you, some of those people might be writers and it's their job to tell the world what they think. So that's a bit on my background, and I want to say at this point that all feedback is helpful, even criticism. So you should embrace the fact that anyone takes the time to read your stuff at any level. I'm still so honored and thrilled and pleased when people take the time to read my work now, and I've been doing this for five plus years, or seven, seven years, including the, the two years of the hobby. To take a few steps back, um, my specialty is feature journalism. So, and to take a few more steps uh, further back than that, journalism, I think, is all about the brain, the ears, the mouth, the recorder, the notepad, the pen, and the keyboard. It's in that order, right? I mean, none of this works without a brain and uh, all the way through to the pad and pen and the keyboard. Like, that's how you craft the work. And journalists themselves document human life and all its joys and sorrows. And that's what you tend to see uh, most of the time on the nightly news or in the daily newspaper. Uh, reporting on the basic facts of what happened, where in the world, and a bit of why, a bit of analysis. Feature journalism, however, my preferred field is a bit different. And I think the major difference is time. Feature journalists are given the luxury of fewer deadlines in order to write longer stories. Their work tends to exist outside of the daily news cycle, and the adjectives that I believe most feature writers are striving for are words like timeless and definitive and authoritative. That's what you want to hear when you write something that's two to 5,000 words long, let's say. You... You want it to stand the test of time. You want it to be something that people will refer to for weeks and months and years to come. You want your work to uh, exist outside of that news cycle, like I say, and tell people, tell your readers something new about the world. And if you want to get into this field, you have to be fucking good. But you already knew that, right? I don't think that good writing can necessarily be taught, but good reading can. You need to soak in feature writing as often as possible, like a big warm bath. My process here is pretty straightforward. Every Saturday, I get three newspapers delivered to my house, and inside those three newspapers are three weekend magazines. 
which are The Weekend Australian magazine, Good Weekend, and Q Weekend. And over the course of the Saturday or the Sunday, I, I like to try and finish it by the end of the weekend, I read all the features that are published in those three magazines, as well as a couple of the arts sections for Inside the Papers. Uh, each, each month I read The Monthly, a, a great Australian magazine which is one of the few to publish long-form stories and essays outside of uh, the aforementioned magazines, and I read Rolling Stone Australia on a monthly basis as well. And between those, I mean, that weekly uh, routine, I suppose, of three significant publications who together publish, you know, let's say 20,000 words a piece in, in terms of features, that's a lot of reading. And um, it, it's something that I love to do. And I think that is a, a big reason why I have gotten where I am in my career and why I still love what I do because when Saturday comes around I can't wait to see what those magazines have commissioned and what kind of stories they're running because I'm a big big celebrant if that's the right word I celebrate um, feature writing of all sorts and outside of those published uh, print publications I regularly browse uh, the weekly newsletters of uh, American journalism hubs like longform.org and longreads.com. Each week they put out lists of uh, the five top feature journalism pu pu published anywhere in the world. Uh, it does skew quite heavily to American publications, but occasionally Australians get in and it's great. Um, so this is something that I spend hours upon hours of my week doing voluntarily because I, I want to. and. I'm employed in the industry, as it were, and I want to see what other writers are doing. But at the same time, I just love reading great stories at a length of 2,000 plus words. Like, few things outside of my partner and my family are more important to me than great written words. So that's where I'm coming from. Like I said, you've got to, if you want to succeed or get anywhere in this business, you have to soak in it for hours each week. This is not a career to get into lightly as a cute little hobby. Because competition is fierce. You'll be chewed up and spat out faster than you can imagine if you don't go into that, go into this uh, knowing that. So to give an example of how competitive it is, those three weekend magazines I mentioned earlier, uh, as of last weekend, I was thrilled and honored to finally be able to uh, cross Good Weekend off the list as it were. I was published in that magazine for the first time last weekend with a feature story on professional referees here in Australia. Uh, so I've been pitching Good Weekend for two to three years. And not every week, not, not even every month, but let's say during that time I would have pitched 10 to 15 feature story ideas, all of which were rejected. And that gives you some idea of the, the dedication and the persistence required to get stories up um, anywhere really like admittedly the weekend magazines here in Australia um, it's a pretty t tight field because there's only so many slots each week where uh, writers anywhere across Australia can be published and of those three publications the, the editors have their go-to writers, they have their staff writers. So it's incredibly difficult for someone like myself as a freelancer pitching to try and match the tone and style and content of what they're looking for. So that example of Good Weekend is particularly uh, pertinent because it just, I just now, just last weekend, I made that breakthrough, but not for lack of trying. It took years and years to get there. So as you can t probably tell, there are some emotional highs and lows associated with uh, freelance writing of any sort, and I think particularly of feature writing, because the nature of this type of writing, for me at least, is that once a story is commissioned, I'll go away for weeks or months reporting on and researching that particular topic before I come back and distill everything that I've learned into two to five thousand words. So during that time, um, you know, you're not getting paid because you only get paid upon uh, delivery of the story, as it were. So the real, one of the real challenges of freelancing is to be juggling several projects at the same time. 
is the easiest way to put it because you want to have invoices coming in uh, you know regularly while, rather than uh, relying on the feast and famine kind of model as it were which tends to dominate a lot of freelancers lives you can go months without getting any uh, significant payments and then you might get ten thousand dollars within a week for stories which have accumulated and finally been published so and um, certainly for people starting out like the silence I, I, I still experience the silence of pitching ideas to editors thinking that they're fucking great and you know you can't wait to write this great feature for a particular editor because you know it's right for their magazine but they won't get back to you they don't reply to your emails you follow up nothing happens nothing can happen for long periods of time and that can be incredibly disheartening I've been through patches even only you know a year or two ago let's say where I you know you think that nothing's going right for you because you're not getting any response from the people who pay you, you know, who hire you one job at a time to write a story for them. When that's not happening, it's incredibly frustrating. And um, the only way to get through it is to be persistent and to, to know that this is what you want to do because at those at moments like that it's so incredibly difficult it's so incredibly uh, appealing to just throw the towel in and stop doing what you're doing which in in moments like that feels like you're banging your head against the wall because you're not getting responses or you're not getting the right responses (laughs) hmm but for me the actual writing of the feature is the hardest bit and it always has been. Perhaps there's no surprises there. Um, it can be great fun, actually, to go out and rep- report a story. And by that I mean to go out and meet people, uh, learn their stories, work out how their their story could fit into your larger story structure, and um, start thinking in terms of characters and scenes, which is what I do with my own writing. Um, it sounds a bit gauche, I suppose, is the way to put it, where you kind of reduce uh, individuals and their stories to it's almost like you're writing a script, a film script of some sort where uh, you can tell that there's a strong female lead character there say or um, this teenage boy has a great story which really resonates strongly with the overall themes of a particular story so putting it in those terms can be a bit let's say confronting for people who are either new to this field or who Um, have nothing to do with writing because for a lot of people you know less obsessive people than myself you don't really think about what goes into a feature story you just you go to your regular job during the week and if you're at a cafe on the weekend and there's a a weekend Australian magazine sitting there you might flick it open and look at the picture and then start digesting these words and uh, I think a great feature story it's so effortless that you don't even notice that you're being led through this this maze or this this path that the writer has crafted um, in order to guide you through this new information and the, the best way to do that is to start strong if your story is not immediately compelling within the first paragraph then how the hell do you expect your readers to follow you through the next two to five thousand words I mean the goal of all good feature writing I think is to eliminate friction and by that I mean you don't give the reader a chance to become bored or to check their smartphone for example which is something that's incredibly easy to do now if you're not entertained by what's in front of you the thing in your pocket can always be a quick solution for a quick fix of entertainment so we need to keep you need to keep in all mind uh, keep in mind at all times rather that Reading is voluntary, it's uh, leisure, it's recreation. Something that people do for fun, including you, I hope, because presumably by the fact that you've made it this far through the video, you're interested in pursuing a career in feature writing. So I think that feature journalism works best when it's a combination of entertainment and education. You are engaging the reader with interesting information and you're teaching them something new. It's a real balancing act. And I want to refer to 
a story that was online that was published recently in QECAND about a guy called Paul Patico, who's a Brisbane music entrepreneur who managed Powderfinger, a well-known uh, national band, and who co-founded Splendor in the Grass, one of our one of Australia's biggest music festivals. <clears throat> so the example that I want to give is of the introduction of that story, because my goal was to uh, again keep the reader interested and to tell them something new. And I think the Paul Patico uh, example is a good one because he's a guy who's kind of worked in the background for a long time without really being noticed. So while people know the, the work that he's responsible for with bands like Powderfinger and a festival like Splendor in the Grass and his various music labels and so forth, he himself is not a guy who has had much to do with the public eye, as it were. So let me just read you the opening paragraph of that story, which I will link to in the show notes. Five of the men who walk out onto Brisbane River stage on this warm Saturday night are well known to the 10,000 fans in attendance, as together they have written some of Australia's most popular songs. Between encores, though, another bloke in a grey suit with short black hair makes an appearance. Drummer John Coquill playfully wipes a towel across the stranger's forehead. The band's frontman approaches the microphone. Ladies and gents, we have to introduce the virtual sixth member of Powderfinger. This is our manager, says Bernard Fanning, gesturing to the man who is now copying a good-natured head rub from guitarist Ian Hogue. He's been our manager for the whole time. His name's Paul Patico. Put your hands together. The crowd obliges. After he gives a few quick bows to the hill and to each of the band members, Patico waves and jogs back to the side of stage, seemingly embarrassed at such public attention. Now that particular paragraph gives you an idea of the company that this guy keeps, the fact that he's been brought on stage at a big show for a big band, and yet uh, he has to be introduced to the fans of a band that has at this point existed for about 20 years. So I think that's a decent example, maybe not my best work, but a decent example of a way to capture the reader's attention by introducing a kind of a surprise element or an unfamiliar figure to a, a common scenario, which is that of a, a big band on stage at a big show. So the question you may be wondering is how do you actually write a feature like that? And with that particular story, what I wanted to do was um, use that example of a big event and a new character being introduced and then uh, kind of treading backwards from there. So the fact I, I was at that show, it was uh, four years ago or so now, but thankfully it was recorded and released as a DVD. So I was able to go back and look at the DVD and you know notice what he was wearing and the cut of his hair and the way the guitarist was uh, rubbing his friend's head. Like all those little details kind of sell the story and kind of draw the reader further along and and keep them interested, right? And they kind of want to know more about who this person is. And I have uh, the band singer introducing him, literally introducing him to an audience, which is always a great kind of opener because it, the purpose of the intro is to introduce either a person or a topic. And here we have uh, one of the best known singers in the country, in, in Australia at least, um, Bernard Fanning, introducing the virtual sixth member of, a ba- of the band, which uh, hardly anyone who knows who this guy is. So I think that's a decent example, you may disagree, of uh, a compelling way to open a story and to keep the reader engaged. <clears throat> For that particular story, for Kiwi Cans, the grass is, all, grass is Greener is the name of the story on Paul Patico. I spoke to about 12 people about Paul Patico, and that was before I had met him for the first time. So I think it's important when writing a, a profile, which is a long feature on a particular person, I think it's important to seek a range of voices. The more stories and perspectives and quotes you can get about a person, and people view certain situations a different way, the better. And once you get good enough at interviewing, you can kind of sense the best quotes as soon as they're spoken almost. It's like a, a sixth sense that's only really earned through practice. And it's only something that I have started to realize myself in my own work 
probably within the last 12 months, I'd say. So, as you're listening to people, they might say a particular phrase or like use an interesting combination of words or an evocative uh, uh, description or an image which just kind of leaps out at you and you can kind of imagine it as they're saying it on the page and just working really well. So, that's something that's impossible to teach, I think. It's just something that comes through trial and error and uh, writing lots of features, I think. Um, it's not something you probably would be able to learn in a classroom, but um, I guess I'm pleased that I, although it took me, you know, five, four or five years to get to that point, it's cool to have that kind of mastery or to know that that, that muscle is there to be flexed at any, t any time, as it were. So just speaking more broadly, very general, generally about interviews, I think the attitude that you should bring to any interview is that this person is an expert in their particular field and I need to learn everything I can from them in order to communicate that knowledge to my readers. And that idea of the interviewee as an expert is crucial to me, or to my practice at least, because um, it allows you as the journalist to admit your ignorance. So in my own work, like I said, I started in music journalism, but I've since become a generalist in a very broad sense. I write widely about a range of topics, and that keeps me interested. I get to write about all sorts of things. I don't feel like I'm retreading the same ground or using the same sources or anything like that. And the fact that I am dipping in and out of so many different fields and subcultures and people and ideas means that by almost by definition there's no way that I can know everything about um, let's say um, smart drugs or mental health or uh, webcam hackers like all these little uh, subcultures or areas of society that I've written about and you, you can't really be expected to know everything about everything I mean no one's that smart and probably no journalist is that smart so it's okay to admit admit your ignorance and to prostate, prostrate yourself, to correct myself, before your source, to encourage their expert voice. Let them teach you. You're there to learn from them. They've given up their time, whether it's on the phone or face to face. They've given up, they've decided to give you their time, which is an incredibly precious resource and a, a gift, really. You shouldn't ever feel that you're wasting your time talking to a source because you never know uh, that that great quote that you really need for your story could be just around the corner if you can only ask the right question and tap into that expert opinion or experience they might be able to break a whole a story wide open for you you never know so it's about encouraging that expert voice in your sources and letting them teach you and that uh, understanding that most people are, are basically good and they want to help you that's a big part, I think, of why people talk to me, because I approach them, I show genuine interest, curiosity in what they are contributing in the world, whatever field it might be. They are doing something, and I want to know about it, and I want to communicate that to my readers. And uh, respecting their knowledge and th them as a person is so important in that, in that field, in that interaction, that transaction, as it were, because... Like I said, time is an incredibly precious commodity, which we all have, uh, you know, a limited amount of. Let's let's be honest. We're all going to die someday, and if someone's going to spend even five minutes talking to you as a journalist about their life or some tiny aspect of their life, it better be worth their fucking while. You better make them walk away from that conversation thinking, "Gee, I'm so glad I spoke to Andrew McMillan or whoever it may be. I'm so glad that." They showed the time. They gave me the time and showed the interest in my work because they gave me the time and they allowed me to explain myself. And they kind of dug deeper than, um, let's say, the average journalist would. And again, that probably comes down to being a function of, like I said, the feature journalist having more time, being able to sit in an environment or with a particular person for um, half an hour or an hour or several hours. Like that's a uh, that's a rare luxury that few newsroom journalists have the ability to do. So, as feature journalists, um, it's something that I never take for granted, the fact that I have 
weeks or months to work on a story and to get it right and to tell the best story possible in the time allowed. That's that's great. And on the topic of interviewing still, uh, you should always keep in mind that nearly everyone you meet likes talking about themselves. People like talking about themselves, generally speaking. And I always think of that a journalist should be a pleasantly curious stranger. You are a conduit for curiosity. And in the moment of that transaction where you're asking questions and they're answering your questions, you need to be a real human with a real interest in the flow of the conversation rather than a robot reading from a list of questions. So this is something that, again, comes down to experience and that kind of strange, intangible sixth sense of knowing how to direct a conversation. And um, by all means, this is not something that I could have done starting out in my my career. Like I always over-prepared, for years I over-prepared with like, regardless of whether it was a face-to-face interview or on the phone, I would write up a big list of questions and kind of then try to order them in, in the right way so that it seemed natural. Like there's a real um, art really to that uh, directing a conversation through the right, ordering of the right questions. However, I mean, by all means, you should prepare for interviews as necessary, but don't feel as though you have to know everything about the person, and don't feel as though you have to read from a script, because the best interviews feel like conversations to both you and the interviewee. So the example that I want to draw on here is my book, which was published last week. It's called Talking Smack, Honest Conversations About Drugs. And for the book, I spoke with 14 prominent Australian musicians about their drug use, legal prescription and illicit drugs. So that's kind of a difficult topic for most people to talk about because for various reasons, drug use is often confined to the shadows. It's something that's done in secret. Uh, Kind of, it's hidden. There's some shame attached to admitting that you choose to use illicit drugs, let's say. So how did I go about convincing 14 musicians like Paul Kelly, Tina Arena, Gautier, Phil Jamison, and on to, uh, to talk to me about something which is incredibly private? And the way that I did it, I think, is, uh, or the way that I did it, it was to contact them all via email in the first instance and kind of uh, lay my case out, as it were, because... I had a book deal, a contract to write this book, and I, I needed that. Uh, I needed people to be involved. Basically, obviously, it wouldn't have worked without um, musicians to talk to. It would just be me telling my story when it comes to drug use, which is not that interesting because I'm less well known than Paul Kelly, and on and on. So, I approached them in a frank manner in an email, or them or their manager, kind of putting my case saying that um, I want to tell true stories about drug use. I want to shy away from the demonization and, uh, let's say, fear and lies that tend to surround the topic of drug use in Australia, certainly. So I was very genuine in my first interaction via email with this request, and I got a lot of no's and rejections. Um, Gradually, the people who wanted to be part of the book agreed to do so, we, we found a time to talk or to meet. Um, for me, it was always a matter of um, meeting these people face to face because, like I say, this is a serious topic. It's something that's usually kept private. Um, understandably, a lot of those people who did agree to be interviewed for the book, they uh, expressed some caution around how I would approach the topic. So for me, it was always very important to be able to shake each of those people's hands and to look them in the eye and to um, show them how serious I was because, I mean, obviously as a professional writer, my first book is a big deal, but at 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 a much lower level than that, it's about, again, coming back to that idea of respecting the time that people decide to give you. It's about just being present, being human, being genuinely curious about what they might have to tell you. And in many cases... I didn't know how the conversation would go because some of the people in the book had never spoken about this topic before. So, um, and another thing that 
you may find inter- find interesting on that topic of uh, preparing for interviews is that I at no point did I rely on um, a list of questions. I would simply turn up, shake hands, we'd sit down somewhere, I'd put the recorder on the table between us and we would then engage on in a topic, uh, sorry, in a conversation about drug use for as long as it took until I felt that I had exhausted my questions on the topic. And that took between 45 minutes for Tina Arena, for, for example, and uh, four hours for Spencer P. Jones. So that kind of approach, if I can be so uh, honest, I suppose, takes balls. It takes fucking balls to be able to sit there and just purely let my uh, interest in the topic and my my wanting to get to the, the heart of the matter, um, that's a difficult task to do. And it's not something that I could have done any other point in my career or anything. Certainly when I was starting, like the, the very idea of walking to a, into a room with Paul Kelly, say, and just looking him in the eye and asking him questions, not from a list of paper, just off the top of my head like that, would have scared the shit out of me, I'm sure. And there were, were moments during the uh, process of interviewing for Talking Smack that I did kind of fall into those uh, awkward uh, silences where I didn't know where to go. And I was able to cover it. I'm not sure whether the interviewee noticed, uh, interviewees. But uh, yeah, I did stumble a few times and struggling to feel silence with the question. But a good way, it, it was incredible practice to put it to put it in very simple terms, I mean, everything that I do feels like practice for my next story or now my next book. Like, this is all... Everything that I have learned and am learning is just going to accumulate like as a, uh, accumulate throughout my career as like a snowball rolling down a hill that gradually becomes an avalanche, which is not a great metaphor, but you probably kind of see where, I, where I'm coming from. Um, the fact that I could sit down with 14 well-known musicians and talk about drug use for a sustained amount of time through my genuine wits and curiosity and um, interest. like That felt pretty good to you know walk out of those rooms afterwards and say, yeah, you know what, I really felt that I got to the bottom of that topic or that conversation. So um, it's not something I would recommend for beginners. It's not something I would have recommended to myself up until, um, you know, start of 2013 when I started working on the interviews. But I'm so glad that I did that approach because it kind of filled me with a confidence which I think I will carry through into any work, any, any more writing work that I do from here on out. Um, still on the topic of interviews, I'm spending a lot of time on interviews, I know, but hopefully this is of value to those watching. I'm not sure why those 14 people chose to spoke with me about a private matter, and it's not something that I really dwell on. Um, you know, why did you want to be involved in the book? Like, it's not really my place to know. I mean, you can't can't really know why anyone talks to you. I'm still, you know, shocked why uh, even people who, you know, musicians are a bit different, I suppose. They're in the public eye. Some of their, uh, you know, a lot of their identity, I suppose, and their some of their money or their in- uh, income can rely on being in the public eye. People knowing who they are and remembering and all that sort of thing but for the talking smack I think the fact that it was for a book like I did have a book contract in hand that probably lent me a bit more credibility it'll have a literal shelf life rather than a a magazine story which come come and go on a weekly basis and um, they kind of just get lost into the ether whereas a book is going to be sitting in bookstores hopefully for a long time maybe not we shall see but as I've said I don't think I could have pulled off the book much earlier than when it came to me. And the fact that I had years of writing experience helped, and I also had relationships with some of those musicians from past projects that I had interviewed them for. But, like I said, the actual interviews I kept freeform, letting my curiosity on the topic drive the discussion. Recorder on the table between us, nothing but my brain, ears, mouth and wits to steer the chat where I wanted it to go. Hmm. So, um, I'm not sure how much use that will be to the beginning writers and journalists who um, may be listening or watching this talk, but 
maybe it's something to aim for down the track. Um, if if you if I had known when I started out that I could get to the point where I felt confident in my own abilities, that I could walk into a room with Paul Kelly, etc., and just have a, a frank discussion with them without feeling starstruck or um, overwhelmed by the thought of the fact that they're here to talk to me or to respond to my questions, like that. Um, kind of expectation or that social it's a, it's a very strange social environment being interviewed and that's what I've found in the last couple of weeks as I've been doing publicity around the book release um, for five plus years I've been I've been the one asking questions kind of sitting back comfortably and knowing where I want to take things whereas on the other side of the equation when questions are being asked of me and you you're kind of required to come up with answers to these um, questions on the spot it's quite it can be quite daunting, and I'm for, I'm still very new to that experience. I suppose. I mean, it's something that I want to improve. Like anything in my professional practice, I want to improve. But um, just that thought of, you know, just whenever you're doing an interview, whether it's for your student paper or for a national magazine, like just kind of take a moment to consider the weirdness of the interview environment because it's. It can be quite artificial, but again, I think it comes down to how you as a professional um, approach it. And it's about creating rapport with your subject, if possible, and making them feel comfortable so that they open up to you. And in the case of my book, which is about a private matter, or what's usually a private matter, that was incredibly important. And again, that's why I wanted to meet those 14 musicians face-to-face. So... As we've discussed, that type of interview is a bit of a high wire act, and I would not recommend you try it until you're confident. For the first few years, I needed the safety net of prepared questions. So I highly encourage that you um, research the fuck out of whoever you are going to be talking to, and that you um, respect the time that they're giving you. In, in, in any case, whether it's a guy off the street for a vox pop or a well-known musician. So, and just to give another example, I, on this weekend just passed, I'm recording this in late July 2014, maybe I should have said that earlier, but uh, on the weekend just passed, I was at Splendor in the Grass, a music festival in Byron Bay, and I was hosting a panel discussion on drugs and music called Loaded, on Honest Conversations About Drugs. It was a kind of a book tie-in event and on stage were several musicians, like uh, members of The Living End and Art vs. Science, as well as uh, MC Remy and the comedian Greg Fleet, among others. And they were there to talk frankly about drugs, which, as we have discussed, is not something that happens too often. It's kind of a, I guess, a recurring theme of the book, and its publicity is the fact that uh, I wanted to move this Um, public debate out from the shadows into the light because I think that once you kind of shine the light on things they become less scary anyway that's a whole other topic but there I was uh, before a crowd at Splendor which um, you know we were there to talk about drugs and what I did beforehand was to get everyone on the phone or meet them in person if I could and just get a, a brief overview of their history with drug use their views on the topic any other avenues of conversation where we could potentially get some interest or some some good discussion out of. And then uh, on the day itself, what I did was just prepare one targeted question for each of the eight or so panellists so that I could kind of give them airtime, get the audience comfortable with them as a person and where they're coming from and get them comfortable talking to the crowd. A few of the people on the panel uh, didn't do that sort of thing very often, so... Um, that was my preparation by kind of doing the background research but only writing down one particular question for each person then having a few dot points for the various other topics that we could turn to and I was, to be honest, I was a bit um, concerned that my approach there would be inadequate that we wouldn't have enough time to sorry, that we wouldn't fill the uh, 90 minutes that was allocated for that particular panel but to my um, to my pleasure and my uh, surprise, the audience chipped in with some great questions and we really got a, a great discussion going. So that's an example of uh, me doing you know, a fuckload of preparation, to be honest, to make sure that I was on, I was on topic and 
fulfilling my role that I'd been hired to do, which is to uh, moderate a panel that would hopefully give people at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning an interesting uh, perspective or multiple perspectives on drug use. So I'm getting towards the end of what I want to say. Uh, there's a few quick points which uh, kind of, let's say, um, general career advice rather than we've been talking quite heavily about feature journalism and about interviewing in particular. These are kind of, I mean, the first one is kind of life advice more than, uh, you know, writing advice. So to keep that in mind, I may not know what the fuck I'm talking about, but then again, I may. So the first thing I want to say is you should exercise um, quite often, as often as possible, if you become a journalist or a writer, because this particular job will often see you sitting at a computer for long periods of time, in my case, working from home, uh, not interacting with too many people on a regular basis, so it can be quite isolating and sedentary, so you can just kind of sit on your ass all day and do fuck all, and that's your day, you're done. So um, exercise, getting out in the street or at the local park, having a kick of the footy or just running around, cycling, swimming, all these things are great ways to either put a cap on your day, which is my preferred way of doing it. I'm not a morning person. I hate. The, I loathe the idea of exercising in the morning, but um, by 4 or 5 p.m., I'm usually fucking done with my day. I don't want to tie up at the computer anymore. I want to go and do something physical. So that, for me, is a great way to... It can be a great reward as well, because, like I say, if you're sitting on your ass all day, sometimes it's going to feel like you're not achieving much. So to go out there and use your body and, you know, open up your lungs and use your your legs and all that sort of shit. For me, at least, it's quite helpful. Um, broadly speaking, as a writer, you, as an emerging writer, whatever period of your career you may be in, you should be always building your network. You should be... One particular tactic that I have used successfully in my career is to email writers whose work I like. Um... As I just touched on, writing for many, I believe, is can be quite a lonely, isolating experience. And even though these things can get published on websites or shared on social media or published in newspapers and magazines, uh, there's it's sometimes it's, it's still quite hard to get a sense of who actually reads your shit. It takes the time to read the words that you so lovingly crafted, I hope. So for me, from, you know five plus years ago, if I read something beautiful or moving or amazing or exciting, I would do my best to try and track that writer down. Some are easier to find than others. You know, some like myself have a very egocentric um, dot com websites which are dedicated to their portfolio. So um, I think I am quite accessible. Some may disagree, but I think that's a better way to be because as a freelancer, my website is my portfolio. It's kind of a way for people to understand that I I'm fucking serious about this job and I want to do a good job, as good a job as possible. And I certainly appreciate whoever takes the time to, whether it's, whether it's just a tweet or a, um, or a long email saying why something that I wrote affected a person. Like That's always great to get that kind of feedback. So I would recommend, in addition to hopefully reading widely, as I kind of mentioned earlier, I would encourage you to try and reach out to writers whose work you like and just say thanks for that story. It doesn't have to be a long email. It can just be, it can just be literally thank you for writing that. Like, I had never thought about that or it was great to hear your perspective on this new topic. Like, these kind of things can, can make a writer's day or week or month. Like, you have no idea what might come out of emailing the right person at the right time. So I would encourage you to build your network in that way. Not in a fake or phony, artificial, plastic sort of way, but in an honest and genuine way. Because, um, I don't know whether it's accurate to say that uh, a lot of writers are insecure, but like I said earlier, it's, sometimes it can be hard to know who exactly is listening or reading, as it were, li- reading your work. So um, if you can kind of send a, a peaceful or a appreciative signal out through the noise or through the silence, you have no idea where that might um, end up. So that's my advice. Um, discipline is the, the you know the very act of sitting at the desk all day or for as long as you can allow. Um, you have to build it like a muscle day by day. 
for the first year or two, I was fucking terrible at discipline. I lived in share houses, and not to blame my housemates, because ultimately, it's up to myself, and it's always up to me to t- determine how I spend my work days. But um, for the first few years, if I wasn't having a good day, or if I wasn't getting, again, that topic of silence, or not getting the right responses from editors, it's very easy to walk away from the computer and go fire up the PlayStation and play some fucking FIFA uh, with my housemates. Like That option always appealed, so... Um, It took quite a a bit of time for me to um, get beyond that and to even look forward to spending um, eight hours a day sitting in front of the computer or reporting stories and doing what I love because although hopefully as it has become apparent throughout the course of this conversation or this presentation, whatever it is, um, I love the shit out of what I do, but some days it is incredibly difficult to sit here and do what I need to do, so... Um, the discipline, it's like I said, it's, it's a muscle, you've got to build it day by day. You get stronger every day that you sit there and do your job, so just keep at it. Like You can't rely on anyone else or blame anyone else if you're failing. Like it, Ultimately, the buck stops with you, so keep that in mind. Um, I encourage you to write everything yourself, and by that I mean including the titles and the subtitles of stories. Um, even if you think they're terrible, just the fact that you're showing the editor who you're filing to, showing them the fact that you're trying to match the tone and mood and the style of their particular publication. Um, And the best way to do that, again, is to just read it religiously and to know it inside and out and to know what these people want because ultimately an editor kind of um, steers the ship, as it were. They know what they want to be showing their readers and if you can tap into that and regularly deliver stories or copy that fits in with those goals then they have no reason not to keep hiring you and to keep giving you work so write everything yourself try out story titles and subtitles and you never know sometimes they make it into print and it's a great thrill to know that your idea was so on point that the editor said you know what he's fucking right that is the right title it's a pretty good feeling and finally storytelling which is not something that i kind of went into here today but We are talking about feature journalism, and like um, so many parts of journalism, it's just storytelling. I mean, we touched on earlier the idea that the nightly news or the daily newspaper is just what happened and a bit of why, but that's still storytelling. It's kind of framing the context of what happened, and feature journalism allows you to spend usually thousands of words um, explaining the context of what happened. So something to keep in mind at all times is that you are a storyteller that's your job remember it thank you for listening to this uh, long and fairly ragged presentation on behalf of pedestrian coach thank you to pedestrian for asking me to be involved i hope that this was informative and educational for i hope this delivered whatever you wanted to get out of it if you want to keep in touch with me i encourage you to sign up to my weekly mailing list called Dispatches, which I will mention in the show notes. It's my weekly deadline. Uh, We touched on deadlines earlier. It's very important to me to meet the 5 p.m. by Thursday deadline to get my newsletter out to my subscribers. And it's a way for me to show great shit that I read in the week before, as well as music and podcasts and any of my own work that was published in the previous week. So if you like the sound of what I've told you today and want to hear more of what I've just told you, um, I would encourage you to sign up to Dispatches. Thank you so much for listening, and I wish you well.